Hi, I'm Devin Boss from Overstock. I'm a senior data engineer on the data engineering team, um, and I love working at Overstock. It's a great place to work. And today I'm going to be talking about best practices of streaming architecture with Apache Pulsar for enabling real-time analytics and machine learning. Now, um, there was a study uh, that was reported uh, in 2017, and one of the notable quotes from this journal article is that leaders focus on data as central to their organizational strategy. Um, and they choose to concentrate on data flows rather than data stocks. So this is an important thing I want to distinguish is the difference between flows and stocks in terms of data, what that looks like and what it means, what the implications are, and how that affects your data strategy. Um, so this is, uh, I'll be talking a lot about this in this presentation. And then the latter part of this presentation, I'll give you a lot of unsolicited advice that I hope you'll put to good use. Um, I'm also gonna cover a bunch of architectural patterns um, and uh, that includes new ones that I haven't talked about in other videos. Um, and then I found another study, a 2015 study that reported that big data are worthless in a vacuum. That should be obvious, but um, its potential value is unlocked only when leveraged to drive decision making. And then to enable such evidence-based decision making, organizations need efficient processes to turn high volumes of fast moving and diverse data into meaningful insights. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about how to make these efficient processes so that your data platform can deliver meaningful insights. Um, now, before we dive in, let's talk about what it means to have a, a bad data story. Like, what are the downsides? What are the implications? Um, well, one of them is that if you have a bad, if you have a poor data story, your company's data scientists and engineers they end up putting on a forensics hat just to get any mean, any meaningful insight out of your data. And if you've ever had to rummage through an old database or work with legacy data systems, you know the pain that this brings. It's, it can be so hard to do your job when you spend all your time trying to you know, make sense of data that just isn't high quality uh, or is hard to find, hard to access. You know, it's like trying to find a, a particular toy in this room, right? And then forcing a kid, like think about forcing a kid to clean this bedroom when the, it's not even their bedroom, right? <laughs> it's just not fair. Um, and it's also not a good use of their time. So poor data quality can cause problems to not surface until, until far later in the process. Um, and that can be when unexpected findings emerge, right? And there can be huge ramifications um, as a consequence of that. So like when those problems aren't discovered until late in the process, right? Let's say they end up in production reports. Now investors like shareholders or or partners or customers are making decisions based on that data, and then you find out that um, that it's wrong or that you need to make major changes that would break all those things, and now it's like, oh shoot, okay, what do we do? How do we fix this? How do we rework and redesign this? And that can be very costly, it can be very time consuming, and if you spend all your development time trying to you know, maintain or fix legacy things, then how are you actually innovating and staying competitive as a company? Um, I've seen companies that just run their agility down to the ground and then some competitor sneaks up, you know, and knocks them right out of the market. Um, and so you can have projects that get bottlenecked by need to obtain particular information that was expected to be provided earlier in the process, where if that information was provided earlier on, um, people could have made different choices, right? Um, and so, for example, like if questions are hard or time consuming to answer, then, you know, oftentimes you have decision makers, they just kind of go with their intuition or their gut based on what they know about the market, based on their experience, based on collecting information from other people. And it could turn out that even with all that collective, you know, information gathering, um, they could be wrong, right? Um, as is the case with Blockbuster Video, which I'll talk about in this presentation. And so, um, you know, if getting insight into your data is, is time consuming, then it's typically skipped, right? Um, and so if it's skipped, then um, you can end up making false assumptions and shortcuts that cause major problems. Decision makers in these situations can take risk averse approaches that actually create more risk, not less. Consider the decision made by Blockbuster Video to not invest resources into online video rental to compete with Netflix. They assumed that people would always go to a video rental store instead of looking at data that suggested otherwise. So they actually had consultants that had studied this and saw the threat that was posed by Netflix, but Blockbuster felt like they were taking the risk averse approach by trusting in what they had always done instead of looking at the data that would have told them that 
it was not the best choice of action. Um, decisions, decision makers who can't quickly access important data can avoid innovating at times when that innovation is crucial to organizational survival. And that's exactly what happened on Blockbuster. So when a major, major market shifts, and then of course COVID was a notable example of that, organizations with poor agility are ones that can't adapt in time. Reducing the barrier to accessing good data improves the ease of making data-driven decisions, which is good for business and great for your partners and customers. When that data is available in real time, entirely new market opportunities open up. And organizations that can leverage this data are the ones that dominate in the marketplace. To paint some context, let's review one of the most common approaches to data processing and talk about some of its limitations. In the ETL approach, a batch job is used to pump data into a data lake or a data warehouse where it can be used for analytics. For anyone who's not familiar with an ETL, its steps are extract, transform, and load. And then ELT is just a slight difference in ordering. Um, in either case, I'll just call it an ETL. And so the batch ETL approach can be useful for solving a lot of types of problems. However, architectural challenges with this approach begin to appear as these operations are chained together to support more complex and recurring operations. And anyone who's built these kinds of pipelines knows it's usually what ends up happening. So let's walk through an example of this. Uh, so let's say we're extracting data from two tables and performing a join. And then we have an update to one of our upstream uh, data tables. Um, but that means that now our downstream data set's outdated. So we've got to repeat the extract operation uh, to get up to date. Um, but then another value changes upstream, and so we repeat this process, right? Now every time you add more data to your ETL operation or perform more complex processing, the performance impact and cost grows further. And so we'll illustrate this. So in this case, we added one additional table to the join, and now we see that so much more computation is just unnecessarily repeated. I mean, most of the rows that were uh, previously joined are overwritten with identical information. And then as joins, filters, and transformations are chained together, the entire pipeline becomes increasingly expensive. And I've seen cases where people are performing joins on 12 or more tables and using very complex case logic that can be super difficult to, to read. And, and then when these tables have millions or billions or, or even more rows, then these operations don't perform well, and consistency can then become a major problem, right? You've got, uh, now you've got race conditions between different tables as you've, you're performing these operations because they're so large, and then you can't just lock them because, uh, you know, then people can't write, and then, and so on, right? So as more operations are chained together, by the time the pipeline's finished processing, <clears throat> um, even if you didn't have consistency issues, that data is already outdated, right? And so, and depending on how long it takes, you could end up, you know, it starts drawing hours or longer, um, and so you become totally bottlenecked uh, in your ability to improve uh, the performance of that. And then when a bug occurs, it can be really time consuming to try and trace through the web of batch jobs to find the exact path to the source. Um, and then of course, you know, if you have to change something upstream, um, well, then you can get a cascade of breaks. And so that makes this very fragile. Um, and then when only a limited number of people know how to maintain these jobs, then the learning curve can further slow progress when engineers leave and need to be replaced uh, by, well, by people who don't have that underlying knowledge of the internal processes. And sometimes those data tables are also hard to read and that just makes it uh, more challenging. As reported in the literature in uh, 2017 in an IEEE journal, developers soon began to realize that ETL pipelines were difficult to build and maintain. Cranking up the frequency of ETL to hourly, say, was an obvious solution, but it merely stressed the rickety ETL pipelines even more, often past the breaking point. And I've seen this at other companies um, that have had this problem, and it can be quite catastrophic. It can really devastate your agility. Um, and then in terms of operational scalability, not just uh, from you know the, the jobs themselves, but also in terms of development time, um, you can have major scaling problems. And of course, on the compute standpoint, those resources cost money, right? It's not free. Um, and as I'll, I'll demonstrate, um, recurring operations really ought to instead be handled in a stream, not just not, not through batch operations like this. Um, and we'll talk about well, why that's so much more efficient. And so in one example, um, in this example, a stream-based approach will take a very different form. Now, you'll see in this diagram, I, I have a cache 
sitting here. Um, that's not necessary. There are other technologies that you can uh, make use of. Um, so this is just to try and give you an intuitive understanding. Um, but there are uh, other approaches that might even be more appropriate where you're actually streaming data directly into what you're consuming. So in this case, it's a website. Instead of the website hitting the cache, you could just be pumping that data directly into the website uh, and have it updated in real time. So in this case, the basic idea is that let's say you've got data that's being collected in a streaming manner, and most of the joining is happening uh, on a per message basis through stream enrichment um, or other transformations in the stream. And then if these, these tables behave like, like caches, like key value or dictionary kind of things, then those lookups are O of 1, which means they're super fast and inexpensive. And of course, if you're pumping that data directly uh, into your app um, that's consuming from the stream, then you even eliminate that step. Um, now, other computations uh, can take place in the message flow as well. Um, like I mentioned, you know, you can have transformations, you can have filters and all sorts of things. Um, and we'll talk about some of those patterns later in this presentation. So to obtain the greatest benefits from a stream-based architecture, what you need to build really transcends the whole idea of a data warehouse uh, or, or even a data lake, right? A lot of, you know, uh, there's kind of been this big moment, you know, big movement to, you know, don't just think about data warehousing, you got to think about the data lake, right? Which is, and, you know, includes some structured data, but that still misses this huge opportunity here. Um, what you really need to build uh, is um, what I'm calling a unified messaging fabric. And this is what accelerates your ability to build streaming assets, right? Instead of just thinking of data as these like fixed things sitting in space, um, you need to be thinking in terms of the stream. And Apache Pulsar really is the ideal technology to build this platform on. The data warehouse and the data lake paradigms, um, you know, they've been very influential, but one critical thing that they miss is that they focus too much on the stationary aspect of the data. And so they miss the focus on how data are created and utilized, and that's really what's more important, right? Like, you, you actually care how you're using that data far more than you care that it just exists. Um, now, data warehouses comprise of data stocks, um, and these stocks are typically occur, uh, obtained through recurring execution of batch operations like the ones we covered earlier, um, or you can be producing data directly to them. Uh, but usually, most people you know, have some kind of uh, transformation or ETL, or they're pulling data from one database or several databases and putting it in there, right? Um, and then uh, a data lake can also, well, that also consists of data stocks. Um, but the big difference is that uh, data lake often, you know, typically will include unstructured data, it can be text data, object storage, things like that. Um, and it's typically in a cloud or a distributed file system like HDFS. Um, and oftentimes they'll utilize technologies design, designed to infer the schema from the data, right? So that's schema on read instead of schema on write. Um, and that can be really useful um, for, you know, data scientists and others who um, want that kind of flexibility to be able to read data. Um, well, it's also easy then from a producer standpoint, they can kind of just, you know, put it into the data lake and forget about it. Of course, that can have consequences, um, some of which we'll talk about here. Um, but it's better than not having the data at all um, or just, you know, ignoring it, even though it could have been useful. Um, so now, now that storage has gotten so much more affordable, it's easy to put tons of data into the data lake. But it can so easily become a data swamp because, like I mentioned, it's really easy for people to just, you know, pump data to it. Um, and, you know, if anyone's tried fishing in a body of water like this, we'll know that it's really easy to get snags in your fishing line. Of course, some people are skilled at, you know, at dealing with those scenarios. But uh, for most of us, that's, that's a problem. Um, and, you know, so if your data lake looks like that, um, you can end up with major bottlenecks in your ability to iterate. So then what you want to build, uh, well, I'll also mention one other thing, which is the cultural challenge. Um, if you have the company practices to just put data in the data lake and forget about it, um, well, that can actually be difficult for your data scientists and those who are consuming data later on who have to say, no, look, you need to be more deliberate and conscientious about what kind of data you're writing and how you're doing that. So just keep that in mind. So what you really want to build is more like a data pantry, um, but with streaming assets. Um, so this is what I'm calling it as a data pantry. And in this idea of a data pantry, the, these streaming assets are curated and made ready for immediate use without you having to mine, fish, or dig for what you need. Right? So there's a very uh, deliberate 
aspect to this. And so the basic idea is that as streams are made available to the fabric and curated for use, consumers can simply plug into them and make immediate use of the data to power their applications. And that's super useful for things like ML and analytics. And although it might go without saying, the most fundamental piece of a stream-based architecture is the data itself. Um, so I'll cover some best practices around how to build good data streams in this presentation. Now the second critical element of your fabric is a set of reusable stream functions that allow you <clears throat> to process, curate, and store your data in a way that enables analytics. And these stream functions, usually you, know, you build them over time as you find common use cases um, and then build those functions in a generalizable way. So as you help your tenants build solutions with Apache Pulsar, you'll notice that pad patterns will emerge in their use cases. And so as you build these reusable functions, you can prevent code duplication and then allow people to deploy functions and just modify their behavior through configuration. Um, and that can really accelerate your, uh, your development time because then it's like, oh, hey, we already have this, let's just plug it in. Um, and so uh, if you have more complex needs, like you need stateful stream compute, um, then uh, there are ways that you can plug in uh, another processing engine like, like Apache Flink, and that can help fill your gaps. Um, your data producers and consumers are the other critical part of your data fabric. <clears throat> and in order to fully support them, it's really important to build automation and visualization. Um, I'll cover some patterns that will help with this automation. Um, and if you have more questions about this or, or have specific needs, I would be you know, happy to, to help you out. If you reach out on LinkedIn, I can give you some ideas uh, and tips. Some I've got some tips in other videos as well, um, so I'd encourage you to check out uh, to check those out. Um, so let's talk about uh, function patterns that can help in your process of building your reusable function library. So the first is the pass through function. It's the simplest and also one of the most useful function patterns. Uh, it's just a function that sits on the receiving end of any new topic you provision for your tenants, and it does nothing more than just move messages from one topic to the other. Um, the primary uh, value that you get from using pass-through functions is they allow you to decouple your function flows from their inbound topic. So this allows you, you to do things like pause flows, you can you have more control over how you're monitoring things, you can disconnect things and then reroute or you know change up your flows without breaking stuff. It allows you to have a lot more flexibility, especially when you need administrative uh, access or to uh, make changes uh, to flows, um, like you know if you need to temporarily block downstream messages, you can just pause this, things like that. There are a lot of opportunities, a lot of things that you can do with this, it's very useful. Um, and then filter, right? There are lots of different types of filters, but the most common one filters out messages that don't meet a particular criteria. And if you see some patterns there, it's really easy to generalize. Um, so filters are especially useful when you're subscribed to topic with high uh, message velocity, and then you just filter it down to the ones you're most interested in. Um, and then um, there are also types of filters that are a little more sophisticated, like a bloom filter where you're actually filtering out duplicates. Some of those kinds of filters require state or things like that. Um, and then a sieve. So a sieve is useful when you're dealing with a message that's really wide or has a large number of properties. And I'm a huge fan of wide messages and wide streams, wide data tables um, for lots of reasons that, um, that I might talk a little bit about this uh, about in this presentation. but. Um, you don't always need all of that data for every specific application, right? So a sieve allows you to filter that down. Um, and basically, um, if we just kind of restart this animation here, uh, behaves like a property filter. So it's just grabbing the, the properties that you're interested in and it's filtering out everything else. And those properties can easily be specified in your, in your Pulsar function user config. Um, and so you can easily vary them, um, you know, for different instances or different deployments that you're running for the functions. Um, then we've got a router. So router behaves in some ways like a filter, but instead of dropping messages, it's actually sending them to different places. So typically different topics. And it, that can also be designed so that output topics and the switching criteria can be specified in the function config. So like you could even say like, okay, based on you know a particular property in the message header, um, that's gonna tell you which topic it needs to go to. Um, and then replicator. So similar to a router, replicator is distributing messages to multiple topics. But instead of routing, it's actually it's just sending copies uh, to each of the output topics. Um, and this is really useful when you need to process copies of a message in different flows, like in a fan out pattern, or when you want to leverage um, Pulsar as your source of truth, um, and then send data 
you know, basically you're replicate, you're leveraging Pulsar to replicate data to different storage technologies, right? So maybe you have different te storage technologies that are optimized for different kinds of workloads or different tasks, but you want them to have the same uh, um, representation of your underlying truth. And this is a perfect way to do that. And then you can have the different topics going to different sinks uh, for those data uh, technologies. Okay, then a merge function, which is a reusable function that subscribes to multiple topics uh, and then produces to a single output topic. And then these topics can be set in the function config. So this could be really useful, like for example, if you wanna combine messages from lots of different topics and put them into particular log storage um, or something like Elasticsearch or, or something that you're using for like kind of a, a more general purpose and you just want to use reuse a single sync uh, to dump all that data into that place. And yep. so, then we've got enrichment, which uh, is also super useful. Um, and in the enrichment pattern, what you're doing is uh, you're performing a lookup to data storage, um, or it could even be a web service or something like that, um, and using that to, uh, to add properties that you're using to enrich um, the incoming message for downstream consumers. And we use this pattern all the time. Um, and the synchronous write, which is a little more uncommon, but still can be useful in certain situations, <clears throat> um, it's most useful um, when you can't proceed in your flow until you know an operation is completed. Now, um, we won't get into like Pulsar transactions and things like that. That's a more recent feature. But from this perspective, um, if you need the ability to, let's say, retry an operation, uh, if it fails, um, this can be useful. Um, sometimes you have consumers that, you, you're, that are expecting that a certain operation and maybe a different technology even has already occurred and that you've gotten an acknowledgement back uh, that says that yes that that uh, that was completed could be a database right or something um, um, <clears throat> in that case um, this pattern is really useful um, and then another synchronous case again not as common but um, uh, this is useful when you need to write a delta to a data source and then once the data is written you need to get a more complete record that includes the results of applying the delta. Um, so this a pattern is, is really useful like when you're working with a graph database and your enrichment query is complex and needs to reflect changes made by your delta. Um, uh, and then we've got a validation router. So this is a router function that allows data scientists to enforce a data contract. Um, it could be used for other people as well, but that's kind of the idea here. Um, so any message that violates their expectations is then sent to the failed validation topic for further inspection. Um, so the validation topic, it's different from a dead letter topic because um, the message like wasn't malformed. I guess you could use it like that. Um, it's a, basically it's still the same kind of concept, but um, basically we've marked it as failed and then we're sending it to a different topic. Um, now in this case, uh, we're enforcing the contract through a, a JSON schema. Um, you can do that in other ways, um, but the idea is that um, you know, you're routing based on something that you're validating on the message itself. And then this is what that might look like from like a JSON schema perspective. So here we're asserting that the incoming data uh, is expected to contain a name field uh, with one of these specific values. And then we're asserting that there's a message property um, uh, named value that is of type integer um, and contains values from 1 to 10. So, um, and there's the name, right? Um, <clears throat> so, since it's a lot of JSON, you can save that in a document store like CouchDB um, or link it to your function config, um, or you can just keep, you know, the whole, th you can just put this whole thing in your function config if you want, um, and that's fine as well. So this is just one additional idea, but hopefully you're starting to get the picture of having, a, you know, a function that's highly reusable, um, where you can, you know, through config changes, you can vary the behavior, because that's really one of the key things I'm trying to get across here. Um, and then transformations, right? This is like super broad topic. Uh, you know, I don't know what percentage, but a huge percentage of functions that we, we have uh, are this kind, where it's a transformation function. And there's so many types of transformation patterns. There's no way I could cover them all here. Um, maybe I'll do another video at some point on, on more of them, but um, <clears throat> one thing that is important to distinguish is um, whether the transformations require state. And if you require a lot of state, um, there is the Pulsar um, uh, Bookkeeper, bookkeeper uh, Table Store um, or the State Store. That's an option, 
Um, and But if you need to do like complex processing, like I mentioned earlier, you can use a stream processing engine like Flink or like Spark Streaming. Um, and so you just want to take a close look at what are your needs and then make sure that you're selecting the technology um, based around your needs instead of like the other way around. Um, okay, so then you can combine these. Um, so in this case, <clears throat> Uh, if you need to perform different types of transformations based on the type of incoming message, you can use a classifier uh, to identify the type of incoming message and then annotate it with an envelope that indicates what type of transformation it requires. And then your downstream transformation function can interpret the instruction and perform the transformation. And then the benefit of decoupling these operations is you can generalize the code more easily. Um, and then you could also route on the message type and do other things that I uh, didn't mention here. Um, so I guess this is this is one case where we're just adding a router, right? So the idea is you're combining these patterns to build out new flows. Um, and then a benefit of adding router is you can uh, vary the behavior of each path, right? So you got different messages coming in, you want to handle them in different ways. Um, and then if you need to perform more complex transformations uh, for certain types of messages, um, then this, will, this approach allows you to have cleaner separation of concerns. Um, and then if you need to combine the messages back into a topic uh, after they're cleaned up or trans, you know, transformed in some way, you could do that with a merge. Um, <clears throat> there are other cases, there's a use case I talked about in a previous video where I'm actually merging from these topics and, and then using Flink uh, to join on a particular key. Um, and I was using that for distributed tracing. Um, and then we have, <clears throat> right, here's another combo, right, fan out sieve, right? So we're fanning out with replication or with replicator, and then we're applying sieve uh, to filter out, you know, different things that we care about. So, like with Apache Druid, um, you typically, you know, if you've got some like gigantic JSON message, um, you might not need all of that to go into Druid. Druid's expecting something more structured, um, so you can grab certain properties that you care about, um, put into Druid, um, and that is super useful. We use Druid a lot. It is a fantastic technology. I highly recommend looking into it. Um, it's really, really useful uh, in combined with Pulsar um, for different kinds of analytical tasks. And getting really into like Druid and how it can help you is kind of out, out of the scope of this presentation, but I just want to put in a plug in for that. And now I'm not getting paid to say that. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so then <laughs> uh, router sieve. So if your incoming messages are super wide, and uh, especially if you've got bandwidth uh, uh, concerns, or you know you're replicating uh, to different clusters in the cloud. And you don't want stuff going across the internet because it's expensive. Um, you can use a router sieve. And so um, now, downside here is you're you're putting all your sieves uh, into one function, um, and so that can sacrifice your separation concerns. But uh, if you do it in a config, if you have a user config uh, for your function that specifies all of those, then it's not it, it, then you can generalize it just fine. Um, but you just have to make sure you do it right. Um, and then you can combine topics um, used for syncs if you prefer to sacrifice some visibility to decrease network traffic. Um, but otherwise, I prefer to just you know separate things out. You get better separation of concerns, and it's easier to see what's going where. Um, and then you can, if you're concerned about network payload size, you can also add uh, some additional compression. Pulsar compression is great. You should definitely make use of it, especially if you're concerned about network uh, payload size. And, um, Okay, so then another best practice, right? This is kind of one of the, well, this is one of those things that we've been, I've been hopefully like really kind of drilling into you. Um, make your functions generalizable. Um, a key feature of well-designed stream functions is their ability to have their behavior varied when making changes to the function configs provided when the functions are deployed. And it's super important because it allows you to build new function flows and add new functionality without even touching your code. Um, especially if you've got code, you haven't you know, even looked at it in six months. Uh, this happens all the time. We, we pull some function out of our pantry that we haven't touched in a long time, and boom, we plug it into a new situation. Um, and uh, it's, you, you know, users love it because um, then you can get them off the ground, like, immediately, um, instead of them having to wait through a whole, like, code development, you know, cycle and get stuff on the backlog and that whole business. <clears throat> okay, now this, uh, the backfill, this is super, super important. Um, it's not a pure function pattern, but um, there are so many cases. I actually recommend if you have any kind of sensitive data flow or you got uh, a really important production uh, application, um, 
that uh, you know where you you can't risk any kind of data loss. Um, you I would say always have a backfill mechanism in place. So let's illustrate how this works. So let's say we're processing messages as normal um, when a code update uh, to producer consumer causes a, a problem and starts losing messages, or it could be a pulsar function that fails. <clears throat> there are various ways it could happen, like messages are getting acknowledged before they should, or they're not getting produced on stream, or there's a transient failure, lots of things that can cause that, right? Nobody's code is perfect. Um, so we can quickly update the, that, you know, that, that object, but we've already lost messages, and so there's a gap in our message flow. So the backfill path, basically you're, an engineer is pushing a button to trigger the backfill, which replaces the messages, and that fills the gap. Um, now, one thing you might need to deal with here is you can have duplicate messages sent downstream. But it's possible you can do this in such a way so that you can be very selective about what data you're actually sending downstream um, so that you can make sure that, um, that it's being handled correctly. Now, <clears throat> general recommendation, um, it's always best if you can write your consumers in a way that's item potent. You want item potent consumers when you're processing from the stream because then if you need to backfill data, um, then um, it can be handled safely and you don't have to worry about other consequences. Uh, so this is just, I would say it's best practice for resilient flows. Um, lots of cases where you need a backfill, um, not necessarily due to any failure in the stream itself, but um, just because you know things can happen downstream. Um, uh, another example, um, we had a situation where um, somebody realized that they weren't producing data in the way that was desired for reports that were like, you know, 10 or 15 steps down the road in terms of processing, um, and they wanted that change. Well, if you have a backfill mechanism, you could change that. You could even do some kind of batch, you know, batch update to your data storage with all that data, and then just run it through your existing pulsar pipeline or through one of these backfill pipes, um, and flow all that data into you know your downstream consumers, get all of them updated, um, and then you're good to go. So this allows you to leverage. Uh, Pulsar for more situations. Okay, so let's talk about the hot swap pattern. So the basic idea is that you've got a real-time customer-facing pipeline and you need to perform a cache lookup for the site user. Um, now, these types of flows can be super latency sensitive, right? Because the, you know, the difference between near time and real time, the way I think of it is in real time, somebody's actually waiting for that response, right? And they could potentially leave if they wait too long or it could severely degrade uh, your web application if they're just sitting there waiting for that message, right? It's like pushing a, you know, let's say you're trying to tweet a message, right? You're pushing the button and nothing's happening, right? Um, that's bad. So let's say we need to roll out a function or roll out an update um, that would break a data contract between functions. And now with other architectures, you know, that can be not so easy, right? If, if you don't have the way, an easy way to like, you know, perform surgery on your flow, um, then, I mean, I've seen cases where people will maintain a legacy application, like I, I've seen, like MongoDB is like one of the, kind of <laughs> seems to be like the go-to example for, for people who, who end up with really bad data situations, um, where they're like, well, sorry, you know, we, we can't do anything about it. We've got this thing in production, we can't change it, we can't take it out, it's, you know, other things depend on it, and it's just stuck, and you end up with this legacy nightmare. Um, it, that you end up maintaining and it like su it like sucks out all your energy and, and development time because you're trying to maintain this thing that needs to change but you can't. Um, so um, you know this so the hot swap I mean I you know mentioned Apache Ignite here but you can you know substitute any other kind of technology where you have a similar type of situation. Um, and so really the key here is um, well one approach here is you're dual producing. So this is where you're actually handling it from your client where your client is actually handling that logic. Now, I'll talk about in the next slide um, a different way to approach this. As it does put some burden on your on your producer. <clears throat> if you don't have instrumentation for Pulsar functions or application, uh, then this could be a, a, simpler, pro a, sim a simpler solution for you. Um, so then you've got that topic, and then this is sort of like an active-active scenario, right? Um, now, in, in this case, all these functions are writing to the same instance uh, that might make more sense as a separate instance especially if you know you could have race conditions um, but basically you want an active active kind of situation here and then you set up a subscription on this topic um, what that allows you to do is start accumulating a backlog on this topic and so that way when you swap over 
um, you won't run the risk of any transient message loss. Um, and so then you can just reconnect, right? And, um, and in this case, well, now I will say if, if you have two separate uh, instances of your data, um, data storage technology that you're using, um, and you set up like an active active scenario, you, you remember you're going to need to run a backfill so that you can, you know, after you connect this, so you're producing to that data store, um, then you run a backfill to populate with all the historical data. Um, and then you can reconnect. If you're swapping out an existing storage technology, like in the MongoDB example that I just gave, obviously you're going to want to be using different technologies, right? So the idea here is you, you can replicate your data to a second pipe and you could even perform other transformations to prepare that data in a way that's consistent with that new storage technology that you want to utilize. And then you'd be writing to that storage technology instead of your existing one in this pipe, right? And so then when you swap over your connection, you'd be swapping over to the new technology. Now, of course, there's a bunch of stuff I'm sure you're going to have to do on the client side um, to make use of that um, to get ready. But, or, you know, maybe if you've done enough pre-processing, then you can make it totally seamless. But in either case, um, just know that you, you don't, only have to use the same st the same technology uh, to make use of this hot swap pattern. And then another approach is where you're using, um, you could use a pulsar function as a replicator. Um, although I, I didn't put it in this diagram or another slide, um, another approach you could take is using uh, pulsar's geo-replication feature. Um, where you're actually replicating between clusters and basically doing the same kind of thing. Um, and so in this case, same kind of, you know, basically an active active scenario, but um, you're just changing um, instead of having the, the client handle the dual producing, you're doing that from inside the stream. And then basically the same pattern there, right? <clears throat> so as a matter of best practice, <clears throat> kind of switching gears here, it's really important that you build automation to onboard new tenants. Um, the less time you spend doing manual work for your tenants, the more time you can free up to innovate. And, you know, that's what you want to be doing, I'm sure. And that's what you're you're good at doing, I hope. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm confident that you can, if you're watching this, I'm going to say uh, you're on the right track here. <laughs> and um, you want to be innovating and building and engineering and creating new solutions to solve problems um, and to make the world a better place. And if you're spending all your time doing things that could be automated, then you're not being your best. You're not making the best use of your time. Um, now, in the new tenant automation flow, um, so this is a flow where we're actually automating how you're handling the creation of new tenants. Um, and again, this is a pattern. Um, so basically, the idea is, uh, you know, first step is somebody is request. They're putting a request. In this case, uh, you've got like a portal or something. It could be a button click. It could be they send a message. Um, lots of different ways that you could do that. The idea is it triggers a message um, into Pulsar that activates this flow. And then from there, um, you've got that message uh, then triggers sort of this cascade of operations. So you've got, um, you're generating roles and tokens if you're using token auth. Um, you've got, uh, you're actually constructing functions through the admin API in Pulsar. Remember that admin API is there, make use of it for administrative tasks. Um, super, super helpful from an automation standpoint, really powerful. Um, and then in this case, we can use uh, a gatekeeper, is what I would call it, in Flink, which basically you're just merging these together um, and that allows you to check, you know, have I, you could even have like a, a, you know, a timer set in there. Have I, you know, within this window of 60 seconds or a minute, well, 60 seconds is a minute, uh, within this window of whatever time you want, have I received all these things or maybe there was some kind of failure and then I want to instead um, send to like a, a deal queue or, um, you know, or, or have, you know, handle that in some way. Um, and then you set up your topics and then you can post that. You, you could have your application consuming from a topic um, that says, hey, we got all this ready. Um, here's your tokens, whatever. It's going to secure portal. Um, and then you could also have something in here that's, that's storing that in some kind of secure storage. Um, and then you're good to go. Um, okay, so let's talk about that gatekeeper. And this is actually um, a more general pattern where you're using um, a stateful stream store like Flink. Um, super, super helpful for these kinds of things um, where you've got a keyed window um, where you're joining messages on a common ID. So in this case, right, so you've got like a request ID 
these two don't match. Um, oh, you know, this part you've got uh, token creation. Let's see, I'll, I'll replay this because it went kind of fast. Um, but notice we've got different things, right? Role, token, function. These all succeeded and it combined these. <clears throat> um, so in this case, these IDs match, um, but then it times out. So then we've got a failure that's going to topic. It, it could be a separate topic or the same, and then you're routing it or however. Um, but a note here, right? So um, it, it's keying, um, it's, well, it's performing a key join and then handling those, uh, those different uh, messages after they're joined. Um, and I also use this kind of pattern for distributed tracing that I mentioned in an, another example or in, in another video. Okay, so as a matter of best practice, it's important to invest resources into curating features for analytics and machine learning. Um, lots of reasons I could get into um, for why you should do this, um, but I'll, I'll try and keep this simple and kind of high level. Um, so let's look at like your typical data science process. For those of you who haven't really worked in that space, um, this hopefully will give you an idea, a general idea of what that looks like. Um, so basically you've got preparation, modeling, and deployment steps. In the meat of this, it should be the modeling step. Um, and that's really where data and machine learning scientists should be focusing their time. It's also what they're educated in, it's typically what they're passionate about. Uh, it's what they enjoy. It's kind of the creative part of ML where you're like, hmm, what, what kind of features can I put together? How can I optimize these? How predictive are these? Let me test this out. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's where, you know, it's really kind of that creative side of it. Um, and then it's also one of the key things that other people can't do super well, right? You need to be able to think like a, like a machine learning scientist to be able to model like that. Um, whereas other people, um, you know, who know the data well, I can do preparation tasks or people who, you know, are good with ops, you know, can handle deployment, automation, things like that, uh, monitoring, alerting, you know, site reliability kinds of things, All right? So let's think about how do we get the most value out of machine learning analytics. Um, and then based on a number of studies that I found, unfortunately, data scientists, instead of spending their time doing, you know, this, like the meat of this, which is really, this is the part that's going to give you the value. Um, from your ML um, uh, or your data science, uh, your data scientists are spending 60 to even up to 98% of their time finding, preparing, integrating, and cleaning data sets. Um, you know, and you know, how many of those data scientists are really super skilled in this uh, data preparation, cleaning, extraction kind of area? I mean, they probably end up becoming uh, skilled in that, but it's usually not what they set out to do. Um, so how are they supposed to build innovative models that really add business value um, when that's how they're spending their time? And then is there any wonder why so many machine learning initiatives fail, right? If you, if you can fail in a day, it's not a big deal. But if it takes you six months, uh, that's a, that can be a much bigger problem, right? You need to be able to iterate quickly. And in order to iterate quickly, you've got to have all this data curated and ready to go. So. Um, by collaborating with, uh, with data scientists and building reusable features uh, through functions in the messaging fabric, um, we, can help, uh, build, we can help data scientists to focus what they're good at. And the key here is by building curated data streams. Right? It's that curation um, that, you know, think of in terms of the, the data pantry, but the pantry not just holding like functions, but also holding these data streams that can just be plugged in to different applications where they can just say, hey, I want these features from this uh, this stream and I want to join them with these features from this other stream and and let's let's try this out. And one of the best ways to do that, uh, I mentioned I'm a big fan of wide streams, context rich streams. And I'm going to talk about why uh, with, with some visuals here. So context rich data streams make the lives of machine learning scientists so much easier. Um, and with wide streams, uh, and when I say wide, I mean, like a, you know, a stream with messages with lots of properties. Um, that makes it a lot easier to identify and collect features for analysis. When your machine learning scientist is spending all their time trying to join different things and different data sets and different tables from different databases, um, it really is, is, you know, can slow things down. And then you end up with these like rickety ETL pipes, right? Um, so this approach will allow your, your 
your machine learning data scientists to focus on the science instead of spending their time doing the data engineering and trying to figure out how to assemble uh, the data set for analysis. So by doing the work in the stream, the stream then perform, uh, provides the curated features that can be easily saved into storage and collected. So uh, let's think back, you know, if several slides back, um, I talked about, you know, the ETL approach and then the benefits of doing that in the stream instead um, from like an efficiency standpoint. Well, this is really, I'm trying to tie these ideas together here. So here's an example um, I saw at the AWS reInvent conference um, a couple of years ago. Um, and at Amazon Game Studios, the developers decided to collect uh, game data to influence map design for the game Breakaway. I've never played it, but I don't know, maybe it's fine. Um, but that was what they were doing. So they, those developers assumed that uh, highly contested areas, so I'm pretty sure this is a shooter game, um, and uh, they assumed that the highly contested areas would be the map center and the tops of these ziggurats where power-ups were located. So they were trying to figure out how are people actually playing this map, how are they using it, um, and they thought, well, the power-ups, you know, people, everyone's going to want those because then it puts them at, at an advantage. So that's probably going to be highly contested. Um, so they started collecting, and this isn't even what I would consider wide stream. This is like, you know, I, I'm thinking wide stream could be, you know, 40 to 400 properties. Like, but anyway, um, this is what they collected. They just needed some specific things. That's okay. Um, so they included uh, coordinates to track where on the map the player deaths were occurring. And their concern was that if um, player deaths were too evenly distributed across the map, then players would get bored of the map and stop playing. Now that's another thing, you know, maybe assumption there, they could validate in the data, but maybe it's, maybe they had a good, a good intuition there. Either way, um, I, I don't have any problems with what they were trying to do here. So um, the events were used to generate this heat map. Um, and the heat map was really surprising to them. And what it revealed was that player deaths weren't occurring uh, by these power-ups at all, right? So you can see as it gets brighter, there are more deaths. And the power-ups are going to be like right here and right here. And they're like, wait a second, people are, why are, why are people not dying over there? Um, so, you know, then that raised questions like, were people not even visiting these areas, right? They built out these features in the map and they're just, are they being ignored? So this is where they, you know, where they needed more, uh, even this is where a wider stream with more data, with more context would help answer these questions. Um, now we're going to walk through an analogy here where context is super, super helpful. Um, just to kind of pay, pay an additional perspective. So starting out with an event like this, it really doesn't tell us much, right? We see that a character died, there's an ID, doesn't really mean anything. Okay, there's a time that's sort of relevant. Um, but um, there's a story that develops as we add additional fields. So now just with three more fields, we can see something that makes this, kind of paints a story, right? We see that there's this person, Mr. Green, in the location library with the candlestick, right? So there's more specific information about this death event. Now, let's say that we add this ID that has this link, right? So we've got some temporal aspect here immediately after some additional event, and then we pull in that additional event. Right now, we see that, oh, somebody entered the room, and we look at the time, and it was about 10 minutes, actually exactly 10 minutes prior to this death event, we see this additional person, from the mustard, watching the library with that same exact item. Um, and now we have a clear, uh, or let's say a highly correlated cause and effect, right? The likelihood of, uh, of Colonel Mustard being responsible for Mr. Green's death, I think is pretty high. So you can see how each additional event or each additional field in the event can significantly improve the value of the context. And then as you gain more context, you gain more insight into what's happening and why. And that is what that's and that is what gives you more power. So more context is more power. Now it can be hard to anticipate all the types of analyses that your data scientists or your even your BI folks, you know, or your ML scientists um, and other types of people are, are going to want to perform on that uh, down the road on, the, on your data. And in general, the more context you collect, the more analytical power you can get from your data. Now these days, it's so easy to compress and move data to inexpensive storage um, if you're not using it. 
there's really not much reason to omit that data when it could be useful for data science. That's my personal opinion. I've seen a lot of cases where, you know, people have expressed so much gratitude when they find out that, oh, this particular value, this particular data that I was interested in, it's been stored for not just the last week, but the last year. Um, that can open a lot of doors. There's another a video that I created a while back uh, that shows a slide where you can see that, you know, as, as data, as your volume of data increases, you get additional value. But then there's also the timeliness aspect. You know, as the data is more timely, there's more value. So when you can combine those two, then you get a lot more power. When you, when you can react uh, to data in real time with all this historical data, um, empowering it as context, then that can be super powerful. And let's, uh, let's demonstrate this. Um, so this is a technology um, using, um, well, this is the Imply dashboard. It's a technology, it's a paid product built on uh, Apache Druid. Again, I'm not being paid by them to say this, but um, this is one example where, in that case, like Apache Druid thrives on wide streams. Um, when you have all that additional context, it allows you to perform, well, when you're using Apache Druid, um, Druid builds a, data, builds a data cube on that data as it's ingested in real time. And you can perform real-time multi-dimensional exploration analysis. Um, and I've had folks who have, you know, they're, they've asked, is this, um, like, is, do we have, like, no data in this thing? Because it's super fast. Well, no, we, in that case, we had tons of data in it. And we had just as much data as another technology that I won't name that was performing very poorly. Um, and the only difference is the underlying architecture. And Apache Druid has a very, very intelligent design in how they did that. Anyway, so again, this isn't a talk on, on Druid, but the idea here is um, when you have a lot of context, you can up, open up a ton of doors, not just for data science, but even for BI, for analytics, for reporting, and all sorts of things. So when you have a context-rich wide stream, it provides a ton of information. And if you have a, if you have a technology that allows you to leverage that kind of data, then you can perform, like in this case with Apache Druid, you can perform real-time multidimensional analysis and really get a lot of insight into what's going on in your data. You can solve problems in real-time. You can perform exploration. You can do root cause analysis. You can try and figure out you know, what's happening and why. And there's so many things that you can do. And then um, if you have data that has really complex linkages, um, graph databases can be really helpful for that. Uh, I've seen scenarios where your link the linkages were just so complicated and all the constraints of SQL uh, for like a relational database just really didn't make sense. Um, another approach, actually, you can also use uh, technologies like Flink to perform graph types of, um, of analyses and, and processing and transformations in real time. So make sure that you're taking advantage of those um, when they fit and make sure you're using the right technology for the right purpose. So as best practice, um, you also, uh, I recommend cleaning up your history. Um, some people have the opinion that you should never process your, you should never alter raw data. And I can see value there, but um, don't just leave it in that raw state forever. Um, like if you're gonna do something with it, make sure you have a mechanism so that you're you always have at least a current representation of your data in in the way that you want to use it that's clean um, and um, you know this is because data contracts tend to evolve right changes and t changes to those data streams can complicate analyses you can end up breaking stuff when all of a sudden your contract changed and now which function version are you are you using uh, to support that how do you ingest your data um, now if you have built that backfill mechanism I've talked about, and you've built out um, function flow, um, then if you have, or even if you, you're, you're just retaining data with Pulsar, then you can replay that data um, and now process it in a way so that you get the best representation of that data. And so um, that is super helpful. And it's way simpler to do it that way, um, way less of a headache than trying to um, have you know build this chain of ETL pipes, um, you know based on batch processing and 
and all that, like I, I mentioned earlier. But I've seen a lot of people take that approach, and then uh, it causes problems downstream. So um, then another best practice, document your data well. Um, probably should go without saying, but each property in your stream, it really needs a detailed explanation of what it does and how it's created, what its expected values are, and how it should be used. Um, and there are ways to partially automate that. Some things can be inferred as well, um, and so make it take advantage of those. So, um, and then to make a point, imagine trying to assemble a structure like this at a Legos without any documentation. Um, I mean, even with documentation, it can be quite involved. Um, and then if you're building sophisticated models, um, you know, machine learning, well, if, if your data, if you're looking at 100 tables and none of them are documented and the column names aren't even, you know, clear, like coherent in terms of what they are, what they do, then that can be a very, very big uh, source of headache. Um, and then you end up with people trying to reverse engineer the data and then what happens when, like I mentioned, like the history or the lineage has changed and now you don't have like a clean representation that you're even working with and so you don't know what to trust or, or you try to build, you know, pipes to ingest it. Anyway, we can kind of go down that path. But um, so a point here is <laughs> keep your stuff well documented and keep it clean. Um, and then use diagrams. Like this, I don't know, to me it seems like it should be obvious, but like in that flow that I described, like if you diagram it out with diagrams like this where you've got the JSON before, you know, basically every step of the transformation, you have an example of what that looks like, then everybody who looks at this will go, oh, I know what this is doing. Um, they see, okay, here's what you're starting with, here's the goal, and if you model this out, then people who actually need to build the functions to do this, they've got a clear, this is what, when I, when I say data contract, this is what I'm talking about. We've got, um, you know, it, it should be pretty obvious what we're trying to do here, um, what we're combining here. So, um, and I guess we, you know, we could even go further here because I guess from dgraph it's not showing that you're pulling that, you know, this this preceded by event from this linkage, but you could even add that to the diagram. Um, so I like unambiguous diagrams that make it crystal clear what needs to be built or how something works. Um, another best practice, make sure you're tracking down the biggest common pain points. Um, you know, that can require going through people to figure out what are the big pain points, but make sure that's that's what you're focusing on, because otherwise you can spend your time on things that, um, you know, that won't really materialize into the greatest value. And then, um, although, yeah, some people think Henry Ford didn't actually say this, it's still a good quote, which is, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So don't build the faster horse. Uh, build a technology that will revolutionize your organization. Um, and then think about the fact that data is the light in your organization. I mean, how can you see things in your business if you don't have that data, right? So that's why it's it's like light. Um, and, um, you know, you can imagine the frustration if every time you walk in a room, you turn on the light and you have to wait 10 minutes before you could even see anything. Um, but, you know, that's what organizations today are operating on. Instead, actually, it's a lot, a lot of cases it's worse, right? They turn on the light and they have to wait four hours before they even see anything. So they... There's no, you can't even go in the room because, you know, it's, it's all darkness. Um, or they're, you know, operating based on a picture of the room from four hours ago, which, you know, sometimes works, but sometimes it's like they're, they could be way off. Um, and that's even just aside from all the benefits you get from streaming and so forth. So anyway, um, make sure that you think in terms of, of your data streams because um, that's what's giving your organization visibility uh, into what's going on in the market. Um, and so you don't want to be like Blockbuster Video, right? And that analogy I gave earlier where <clears throat> they had an opportunity to make a business decision based on the data. They could have been like miles ahead of Netflix because they had a lot bigger budget, they had a lot more resources. Um, they could have just really quickly transformed their organization and become the dominant company in the industry for streaming online video. Um, but they, they, but they didn't do that. <laughs> and they went bankrupt. Um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love feedback. Um, so please, you know, if you have comments or questions, I would love to see that. I'm always trying to figure out how to give more effective presentations um, or how to um, provide more content that's going to be of greater value. So um, I'd love to see your comments in the chat um, and or reach out to me on LinkedIn or even Twitter. You can reach out to me there. Um, and then there's some other resources. I want to take a screenshot of this. Um, oh, yeah, if you want some comedy on uh, data linkage, um, 
I've got a good analogy for you. Um, I I was I was laughing pretty hard when I saw that. And uh, anyway, so for Pulsar references resources, um, we got some good videos here. And of course, there's the Pulsar Slack channel mailing list. We're trying to migrate to uh, Stack Overflow, so um, that's another good place uh, to put things. And then and then there's lots of great videos on Pulsar as well as the other technologies that I mentioned here. Um, and then my Twitter I put on here and LinkedIn is right here. So take a screenshot, reach out to me, connect. Happy to connect and happy to talk through your scenarios. All right, thanks. I uh, hope you have a great day.